I think we'll get started. Um, this is an unbelievable crowd. And I've already asked Dr. Diamond whether he'll come back to be a Mondavi speaker, and he said he would if we provided the right kind of wine. I think we can <laughs> manage that. So let me introduce myself. My name is Phyllis Wise, and I'm the Dean of Biological Sciences, and I would like to welcome all of you here today for the first in our series uh, this year of major issues and store lectureships. And I literally want to take just five seconds to tell you that this lecture is made possible by a very generous endowment um, made in the 1960s by Tracy and Ruth Storr. Um, Dr. Storer was a professor in zoology, and his legacy really lives on because it allows us, his, his endowment allows, their endowment allows us to invite speakers like Dr. Diamond and other very eminent people in the life sciences. So I'd like to now introduce, um, who's going to introduce Dr. Diamond. <laughs> Wow, what a great crowd. It's a real honor and pleasure for me to introduce uh, Jared Diamond to you today. He's one of uh, America's most uh, distinguished scientists. Uh, I don't know how many of you uh, know about him. Certainly all of you know something about uh, uh, Professor Diamond. But uh, his research career uh, comprises two major areas, membrane physiology and community ecology. Those of you who read his uh, popular books may not uh, uh, know that. He's earned uh, uh, many honors uh, for this work. Uh, the uh, list is, uh, is uh, very long. Uh, I can only uh, mention a few of the high points, which include election to the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, U.S. Uh, uh, National Science Medal, with Japan's Cosmos Prize, and a Tyler Award for the Environmental Sciences. So uh, this uh, uh, scientific work of his has been uh, uh, much honored. He's also had a long uh, interest in the topic that he's going to talk about today, human uh, uh, behavior. I remember the earliest uh, a piece of his I uh, read was uh, one on uh, the simple toolkit of the Tasmanians. It was a news and views piece in Nature in 1978. It's still something I uh, uh, cite. Uh, and he's just recently moved to the, uh, or taken a chair in the uh, Department of Geography at UCLA, so his uh, interest in that uh, topic has uh, has grown with the years. Uh, another major facet of his career has been uh, uh, popular science writing, and, and I suppose that that's how uh, uh, most of you uh, uh, know his uh, work. He has a series of, uh, of articles in Discover and uh, uh, Natural History magazines, which are, in, in my estimation, uh, really excellent uh, things. He's a longtime contributor to the uh, News and Views section of Nature. Uh, uh, I don't know how many uh, contributions. And this is a funny kind of uh, popular science writing, if you want, because it's, uh, it's popular science writing for other scientists. And it seems to me that this is a really important genre as, as science gets uh, a bigger and more specialized. The way that we talk to uh, other scientists is through the medium of what uh, uh, we're all laymen with respect to most of the other disciplines. So we learn what we learn about those disciplines from uh, writing such as... Uh, uh, Professor Diamond does. In his uh, News and Views pieces, I really cherish. They're really great uh, things. And one of the, aside from being insightful and, and, and uh, 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 taking up interesting topics, uh, uh, Professor Diamond is also really level-headed. Uh, it's really hard sometimes to penetrate another discipline. Uh, in the, uh, you never know what you're buying. You have to trust uh, uh, the uh, reporter, as it were, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, soundness and reliability of his uh, pieces in, in news and views, uh, I'm sure is why he's been invited to write so many of them. Uh, his uh, book, uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel, another uh, a piece of his uh, uh, popular science writing, uh, won the uh, Pulitzer Prize. So in this endeavor as well, he's had a, a prize-winning career. Today he's going to speak to us on collapses of ancient societies and their modern implications. Please join me in welcoming Professor Diamond. Let me first check whether you can hear me in back. Yes. Can you hear OK in back? Can you hear too much in back? 
it's a pleasure to be here today, particularly because I get to talk with you about a especially interesting subject, the question why some societies have collapsed in the past and others have not, and what it might all mean that would help us today in making sure that our society is among those that does not collapse. My interest in this area began really as a teenager with interest in those romantic mysteries of abandoned ancient ruins testifying to the collapses of ancient societies that left behind them monuments no longer inhabited, such as the Maya cities nearby in Central America and Angkor Wat. By collapse, I mean a drastic decrease in human population numbers and or in political, economic, or social complexity over a large area for a longish time. Why do societies collapse? It's a romantic mystery, but it's more than that. It's also a big intellectual problem to understand why some societies collapsed and others didn't. There's been overwhelming recent evidence gathered in the last 20 years from archaeology and other disciplines that some of those romantic, mysterious collapses were self-inflicted ecological suicides, inadvertent suicides, resulting from human impact on the environment, similar to, through mechanisms similar to problems that we face today. And that's despite the fact that these past societies have far fewer people and much less potent destructive technology than we have today. 6,000 people with stone tools instead of 6 billion people with nuclear power and bulldozers. Possible cases of past societies that undid themselves and committed ecological suicide include the societies of the Fertile Crescent from Iran and Iraq to Jordan and Palestine, Mycenaean Greece, Easter Island and some other Pacific islands, the Western Roman Empire, classic lowland Maya, the Anasazi and Angkor Wat, Great Zimbabwe in Africa, Cahokia outside St. Louis, and Norse Greenland, and the Harappan Indus Valley civilization. These romantic mysteries, though, are relevant to the environmental problems that we face today, because these past societies undid themselves by many of the same mechanisms deforestation. Today we face the end of the tropical rainforests, overfishing, soil erosion, soil salinization, climate change, overutilization of fresh water supplies. And today, added to that list that we've had in the past, approaching the photosynthetic ceiling, exhaustion of energy reserves, accumulation of toxics in water and food and soil, an increase in the world's population and in its per capita impact. But the problem is complicated because it's not the case that all societies in the past collapsed. There are plenty of societies that went on for thousands of years without committing ecological suicide, such as Japan, Tikapia, Tonga, and the New Guinea Highlands. What then is it that makes some societies more fragile than others? are the fragile ones, societies that have the misfortune to be living in an especially fragile environment, or are they societies whose people were especially imprudent? Another complication is that environmental problems don't exist in isolation from everything else. And as this project went on, I've arrived at a five-point framework for understanding collapses and declines of societies. In no particular order, we have human impact on the environment, where my interest started out. Secondly, that interacts with climate change. A society is most likely to collapse when the climate has gotten cold or dry and is working against it. A third factor is that most societies are supported by trade with friendly neighbors, and if that trade drops out, that can contribute to collapses. Most societies also have varying hostilities with neighbors. And when a society gets weak for environmental or other reasons, 
the hostile neighbors may move in, making it difficult to decide whether pro the primary cause of the collapse was the barbarians at the gates or was the society's own problems, hence the running debate about the Western Roman Empire, whether the barbarians were just the final blow to a weakened Rome or whether they were the fundamental cause. And then finally, the fifth item on the checklist is the society's responses, the political, economic, and social institutions of a society that make it either more or less able to cope with its environmental problems. Today, mostly I'll talk about deforestation, which is just one of the 12 major classes of threats facing societies in the past and today. I'll tell you about the deforestation-driven collapse of Easter Island and the Southwest Pacific Ocean, Southeast Pacific Ocean. I'll just discuss why is it that Easter, out of hundreds of Pacific islands, was so extreme in its degree of deforestation when it was settled by the same people who settled most of the rest of the Pacific. Then I'll talk about why is it that the Easter Islanders or any society made mistakes. And finally, I'll talk about some signs for hope of how logging companies and other big industries are finding ways of getting along with environmentalists in the modern world, giving us one of, in fact, our main reasons for hope in the face of six billion people hammering away with bulldozers. Let me first ask, has anybody here been to Easter Island? Raise your hand. <laughs> Go if you get the chance. You fly to Santiago, Chile, and then it's a five-hour flight from there. And no matter how much you've read about it, no matter how many pictures you've seen, it is overwhelming. Easter Island, it's the most remote habitable scrap of land in the world, about 2,000 miles from the coast of Chile, 1,500 miles from the nearest islands of inhabited islands of Polynesia to the west. And what it's famous for is those giant stone statues, stone statues up to 32 feet tall and weighing up to 90 tons that were carved and then transported overland up to 10 miles and then erected into an upright position. All that by people who had no draft animals, no machines, and they had to do it all with human muscle power. How, if you have your, only your own muscle power, are you going to drag a 90-ton statue 10 miles and then tip it upright? And on top of that, they also carved an extra piece called a top knot, pukau, red, of redstone, which weighed up to 12 tons, tons, and which they put on top of this 32-ton statue. So how, after you erect a 32-foot-high statue, do you then lift a 12-ton top knot another 32 feet into the air and put it on top? It's a mystery. It has been a mystery. And all that was done by Stone Age people without metal tools. When Europeans, quotes, discovered Easter Island in 1722, the islands were in the process of pulling down and breaking their own statues that they had erected at such enormous effort. How, why, and who erected them? To a Heyerdahl rekindled interest in this question by his theories that Easter was colonized and the statues were built by Native Americans, and it's now clear that he was absolutely wrong, but nevertheless he interested a lot of people, including me in Easter Island. In the last few decades, the ecological basis of the collapse has become clearer. If you look at the Easter Island landscape today, when I went there, it's very striking. Um, it's a relatively dry, barren grassland with no native trees whatsoever. The last place in the world that you would expect a complex civilization to arise. And without trees, native trees, no apparent mechanism for transporting or erecting statues. The explanation for this complex civilization arising in this barren landscape became clear from paleobotanical and archaeological studies of the past 20 years. When the Easter Islanders arrived at the island in AD 800, remember they were Polynesian people arrived from the west, the island was covered with a subtropical forest, among whose trees were what used to be the world's biggest palm tree, 
Easter Island palm with a trunk diameter of six feet, and a couple of a dozen other tree species, including dandelion relatives of tree height. Today, Easter Island has no native land birds whatsoever. The only island in the Pacific that I know of without native land birds. But on this, when Polynesians arrived there, there were at least six species of native land birds. And there were 37 species of native seabirds. So the people arrived at this lush, semi-tropical paradise, subtropical paradise, around AD 800. And because Polynesians are farmers, the Easter Islanders began to clear the island, parts of the island, for gardens. They also used trees for firewood and for heat in this climate that got cool in winter. And they used the trees for making canoes, with which they went out to the open ocean and hunted porpoises and tuna. They ate the land birds. They ate the seabirds. They ate the fruits of the palm trees. And they probably used the palm trees as rollers or as canoe ladders for transporting the giant statues, and then as levers for levering the statues up into a vertical position. And they also used other trees on the island as sources of rope for dragging the statues. After colonization of Easter around AD 800, population increased until in the 1600s, population of Easter, as best we can estimate, exceeded 10,000, maybe 15,000, maybe 30,000 people. And again, by the mid-1600s, the paleobotanical studies show that they had cut down all of the forest to the point where the palm and those 21 other trees were all extinct. All of the land birds were extinct. Out of the 37 species of seabirds, 36 were eliminated from the main island, and a few survived on offshore stacks. The consequences of this total deforestation of the Easter Islanders were severe. Without trees, they no longer had the rollers or canoe ladders or levers to erect the statues. They no longer had the rope to drag the statues. So construction and erection of the statues stopped. And again, one of the most surreal places in the world that I visited is the quarry on Easter Island, Rano Raku, a volcanic um, cone, which was the, provided the stone for carving the statues. And in Rano Raku, there were something like 400 statues still left in the quarry in all states of completion. Statues just being chipped out of the rock, statues chipped out down to the keel, statues being transported down the slope, statues that are erect. And then there are three roads leading Rano Raku going around the island. And along the roads, there are maybe 100 statues being transported towards the coastal platform. And in the quarry, scattered over the floor of the quarry still today, are prodigious numbers of the stone chisels with which they were carving these statues. You can still see the rims around the statues where the carver stood to chisel them. You can still see the hooks on which they hung their gourds for their drinking water. And you can still see the furrows um, smoothed out by the ropes with which they lowered the statue. So the whole sense is of a factory in which someone blew the whistle at noontime and everybody went off on a lunch break. And they never came back, leaving all the statues in whatever state of incompletion they happened to be. So without trees, they couldn't erect statues. Without trees, they ran at, they had no firewood except for small bushes and agricultural wastes. Without trees, they ran out of much of the mulch fertilizer that they used to fertilize the soils, so their agricultural yields decreased. Without trees, they had no canoes, and so they could no longer go to the open ocean, tug porpoises and tuna. They had exterminated the land birds. They were down to few seabirds, so they had run out of most of their protein. And in the 1600s, Easter Island society, which had been a typical Polynesian chiefly society, underwent a political revolution in which the government by the chiefs was overthrown and a warrior class, the Matatoa, took over. And without these other sources of protein, islanders turned to the largest animal left on Easter Island for food, namely other humans. Um, the worst insult that an Easter Islander, one Easter Islander could say to another was, 
the flesh of your mother sticks between my teeth. <laughs> the population crashed from 30,000 down to about 3,000 at the time of the first adequate European census, 90% die off. And in addition, there was then no possibility of rebuilding the society because they had destroyed the trees and the birds on which the construction of the society had originally depended. I think the reason that of all the articles that I've written in Discover Magazine, perhaps the one that has grabbed people most is the article on Easter Island because people recognize that Easter Island then is a metaphor for the state of the world now. Easter was so remote that as Easter society was collapsing, there was nowhere that the islanders could turn for help. There was nowhere to which they could flee. And similarly today, if planet Earth gets into trouble, we risk a global collapse, and there's nowhere that we too can go for help or to which we can flee. I have to wonder. At some point, somebody cut down the last palm tree. And my students have asked me this question. What do you think they said as they cut down the last palm tree? <laughs> I can only guess by what people say under similar circumstances today. What about our jobs? Do you care for more for trees than you do for our jobs? Or respect our private property rights? Get the big government of the chiefs off our backs? Or you are predicting environmental disaster, but your environmental models are untested. <laughs> we need more research. Or, don't worry, technology will somehow solve all our problems. <laughs> the collapse of Easter is doubly puzzling when you reflect that there were hundreds, maybe thousands of other occupied Pacific islands occupied by Polynesians, Micronesians, and Melanesians. Easter was almost unique in being totally deforested with all the trees extinct. Only two other Pacific Islands approach Easter in its degree of deforestation under indigenous conditions before <coughs> European arrival. Two other, two outlying islands of the Hawaiian group, Nihoa and Necker, were deforested or nearly so, but Nihoa still retained one species of palm tree. So, Easter and extreme deforestation. There were quite a few Pacific, other Pacific islands that were largely but not completely deforested, like Mangareva, most of the Cook and Austral Islands, and the leeward side of the big Hawaiian and Fijian Islands. Still, other Pacific islands were even less extreme. They retained primary forest at high elevation, and at low elevations, they had a mixture of secondary forest, grassland, and fernland. Uh, that was the case on the Society Islands, like Tahiti, the Marquesas, and the windward side of the big Hawaiian and Fijian Islands. And then there are quite a few Pacific Islands that, on European contact, although inhabited, were still largely covered with forests. Tonga, Samoa, Makatea, the west side of New Zealand's South Island, and most of the Bismarck's and Solomon's. How can we account for all this variation in degree of deforestation among Pacific islands. The archaeologist Barry Roulette at the University of Hawaii and I have been collaborating in a study to try to understand why Easter almost uniquely got deforested. Was it that the Easter environment was especially fragile? And Barry approached this problem by combing through the journals of the first European navigators and explorers who came to this region. And so he was able to extract from these journals estimates of the forest cover of the island, the 82 islands, after centuries or millennia of Polynesian, Melanesian, Micronesian occupancy, but before European impacts. And Barry coded that degree of deforestation on a crude scale of 1 through 5. Then he also tabulated environmental variables that we thought might contribute to deforestation. And Peter Matusik at Stanford kindly suggested several other 
variables that we should look at. So we ended up with nine variables, and we then did a statistical analysis, bivariate correlations, multiple regression analysis, residual analysis, and tree analysis to see which of these environmental variables were contributed or were particularly important in explaining the degree of deforestation. Of the nine variables, we had guessed correctly six of them ourselves. Before doing the analysis, Barry and I guessed that deforestation would depend especially on rainfall and latitude. And yes, that was true. Rainfall and latitude proved the two strongest predictors in our bivariate and multivariate analyses. Wet islands, dry islands were more likely to be deforested than wet islands because the strongest predictor of plant growth rates is rainfall. And the wetter the island, the faster the trees grow back once you cut down the original trees, so an island can get reforested. Whereas a dry island, when you cut down the trees, it's a long time before new trees grow up, and the island is likely to remain deforested. Latitude was the, other, was the second most important variable. The further from the equator, the colder it is. And the second strongest predictor of plant growth rates besides rainfall is temperature. So islands further from the equator ended up more deforested than islands close to the equator. Three other variables we anticipated correctly, their effects. Elevation, high islands ended up less deforested than low islands. And that's because high islands gather clouds about them and produce what's called orographic rain, rain dependent on high elevations. And that rain from the high elevations then comes down to the lowlands. So even if the lowlands are dry, there's water coming down to them from the mountains. And that water also carries nutrients and dust to restore the fer fertility of the lowlands. We anticipated correctly that distance would be a significant factor. More isolated islands came out more deforested because an island that has neighbors has an escape valve as population builds up, the surplus population emigrates or gets pushed off and goes to other islands. Or as social complexity and energy and surplus food build up, it gets used in trading or raiding with neighboring islands. Or as one of the members of the audience at UCLA yesterday commented when I was talking about the Easter Island problem, uh, the person said, on an island with neighbors, the boys have other games to play, meaning that the chiefs will expend their energies on other things than chopping down the forest, increasing population, putting up statues. And then finally, the sixth of these predictors that we correctly anticipated was area. Bigger islands ended up less deforested than really small islands in the Pacific. And there may be a number of reasons for that, such as that it takes longer to deforest a big island. The deforestation may not have been reached its end point by the time of European arrival. And also that a big island is more likely than a tiny island to have some areas that are unsuitable for human usage. So those six factors we guessed. Oh, and one more we guessed correctly. Makatea is a dreadful Pacific island land formation called Makatea, which is basically a coral reef that's been lifted up into the air. And it's razor sharp, and it's got holes two feet across and 32 feet deep. So it's absolutely dreadful to walk around in. Um, and not surprisingly, although Polyne although I with boots hate to walk around in Makatea, Polynesians without boots also evidently didn't like it. And so Makatea, although some Makatea was chopped down, Makatea islands and Makatea areas got less deforested than did non-Makatea habitat. The three surprises to us were, first of all, the effect of island age. Most Pacific islands are volcanoes that blew off at various times in the past that can be dated. And the older islands, the ones that blew up earlier in the past, tended to end up more deforested than islands that have blown up, whose volcanoes blew up only recently. The explanation pointed, to, pointed out to us by Peter Batusik is that a young volcano lays out new terrain with fresh nutrients. And as rain falls, the rain gradually leaches out the nutrients. And that goes on with time until Peter and his colleagues found that 
a island, volcanic island, behaves as essentially young in its nutrient content up till about the age of 20,000 years. And more nutrients get out and get leached out until by 200,000 years, it's a medium old island. And an island a million years or more has had its nutrients essentially leached out, available nutrients leached out by the rain. But even in the presence of adequate rainfall and temperature, soil nutrients can be the limiting factor for plant growth. So that's why it makes sense that old islands ended up more deforested than young islands, because plant growth there was limited. Plant regrowth was limited by inadequate nutrients. The next to last factor, which was a surprise for us, and turned out to be the third most important predictor, was ash fallout from volcanoes. In the Pacific, geologists know of something called the andesite line, A-N-D-E-S-I-T-E, -E, which runs roughly north-south down the Pacific. West of the andesite line, the volcanoes blow out ash, which can get carried by the wind for 1,000 miles. East of the andesite line, the volcanoes blow out little ash, but instead they put out lava, like the main Hawaiian uh, volcanoes. And it turns out that islands west of the andesite line, or within a modest distance of the andesite line, ended up less deforested than islands far east of the Andesite line. The reason uh, is that that ash blown out into the air can restore the fertility of soils whose nutrients have been leached out by rainfall. And the last factor was the biggest surprise to us. Again, this was something Peter Batusek sensitized us to. And this is that for Pacific Islands east of the Andesite line, far east of the Andeside line, so they're not getting ash-borne nutrients, and that are old and well leached by rain, the most important input of nutrients becomes the dust that's picked up by winds in the steppes of Central Asia and blown up into high, high into the atmosphere and then carried eastwards for thousands of miles over the Pacific. And there are people who've collected dust all over the Pacific, so you can map the dust. The further east and southeast you get in the Pacific, the less dust there is. And even in Hawaii, it's this dust fallout from Central Asia in the areas away from the volcanoes, from the young volcanoes themselves. It's this dust fallout that becomes the limiting factor in restoring soil nutrients. So the further you get from the Asian dust plume, the more likely an island is to get deforested. Those then were the nine correlates. How does Easter Island stack up against these nine predictors of deforestation? Turns out that by eight of the nine variables, Easter was an especially fragile environment. Easter is, the, of our 82 island database, Easter had the third highest latitude. It was the third <coughs> coldest, 27 degrees south. It had the lowest tephra fall, because it's furthest east of the andesite line. It had the lowest ash fall. So it had the lowest dust fall because it was furthest from the dust plume of Central Asia. It had the second greatest isolation. It had among the lowest rains, among the driest climates. It, Easter, by the standards of our Pacific Island database, is a relatively small island and relatively low in elevation. It's a moderate age. But Easter's three volcanoes are of different ages. And lo and behold, the oldest volcano on Easter, Poiki, is the one that got deforested first and suffered the worst soil erosion, fitting the predictions about the effect of age. And the only thing that Easter had going for it, its only saving grace was that it had none of this awful terrain called Nakatea. But on eight out of the nine grounds, Easter was especially prone to deforestation. So it's not the case that the Easter Islanders were especially stupid or imprudent. They just inherited the most difficult environmental problem in the Pacific, and that's why their island ended up deforested, and Samoa, Tonga, Tikopia did not. The next, the last thing that I want to talk about is the question, why people make such mistakes? Because you would think, here they are chopping down their trees, and they can look around, and they know that they need trees for canoes and for putting up statues, and they can figure out that when they chop down trees, the soil gets hot and dries out. So it's not subtle that chopping down their forest is bad for them. Why didn't they notice it? Or why didn't they do something about it? Why did they go on? Why did they make such an awful mistake? When I was teaching a course in Collapses of Societies, 
for the first time at UCLA this past winter, I hadn't appreciated this issue, and it was my UCLA students who sensitized me to this by asking me with society after society, why did the East Rivals, why did the Anasazi, why did the Maya do what looks like such dumb things? But this is part of a broader question, namely failures of group decision making. I was interested in it because of this failure of group decision making in Pacific Islands that deforested themselves or wiped out their bird fauna. But we all know of failures of group decision making elsewhere in the past or in modern times. <laughs> President Kennedy had the same group, virtually the same group of advisors for the Bay of Pigs and for the Cuban Missile Crisis. And at the Bay of Pigs, those advisors performed disastrously. And at the Cuban Missile Crisis, they performed well in perhaps the most difficult challenge the US has faced in the last 60 years. What went wrong with group decision making at the Bay of Pigs? The introduction of the rabbit into Australia, multi-billion dollar damages. The Australians, they made five consecutive tries to introduce rabbits. The first four times, <laughs> the rabbits died out and they kept working at it. And they introduced the rabbits and now they're going to all the effort today to, to exterminate them. How could they have been so stupid? as to introduce rabbits that now consume half the vegetation. And everybody knows that rabbits eat plants, half the vegetation that could otherwise be devoted to sheep and cattle. Overfishing, the majority of the world's commercial fisheries either have collapsed or are in the process of collapsing from overfishing. And it's not so. Every fishing fisherman can see that it's taking more and more work to land those fish. Or in United States society in recent years, uh, the, cut, the role of the looting of big businesses to the decline of the stock market, um, the, the looting of firms like Enron by their own CEOs. Uh, you would think that it would be relatively simple to have monitoring agents, to have board of directors preventing CEOs from doing something obviously bad for all the stockholders and the employees in the rest of the country as looting the pension fund. How did the Enron executives get away with those mistakes? Well, I've arrived at a roadmap of four sets of considerations to understand why some societies end up making serious mistakes. Number one, they may fail to anticipate a problem before it arrives because they've had no prior relevant experience. For example, when the when the British colonists into Australia introduced rabbits. They really didn't have any reason to believe that rabbits would be bad because there were rabbits all over in England um, where they had lived. And they had no experience of the effect of rabbits on the landscape where the plants evolved in the absence of rabbits. Or when, the, when Norwegians settled Iceland in 871 AD, they were used to Norway, which has relatively thick soils. And so if you deforest Norway, the, tr the soil doesn't blow, blow away. They have no prior experience of a landscape like Iceland, where the soils are originate as light ash blown in by volcanoes. And when you remove the forest cover, the ash that the wind blew in, with the vegetational cover stripped off, blows out. No prior experience on Iceland of that problem. And the Easter Islanders came with experience of wet or high islands, and they weren't prepared for to anticipate what would happen on Easter. That's step number one, failure to anticipate. Step number two, failure to perceive a problem after the problem materializes. Some problems you can't perceive because they're literally imperceptible. Salinization and leaching of soil nutrients have been major agricultural problems in Australia, and salinization now is a big problem here in the Central Valley of California. But this is a problem that was literally imperceptible because you can't see the nutrients, and you can't see the salt a couple of yards down there in the soil. <laughs> or the prime example of a difficult to perceive problem today is global climate change. If world temperatures went up inexorably by 0.1 degrees centigrade every year, year after year, we wouldn't be arguing about climate change. But in fact, temperatures may go up two degrees this year and down three degrees the next year, down another two degrees and then up four degrees. So given that there's a slight signal in a lot of noise, you need a long time series. 
in order to convince yourself that there is a slow trend buried within that noise. And it's only about two years ago that the last climatologist seriously concerned with climate problems acknowledged that there is global warming going on. The residual arguments about, are about whether that global warming um, is going to produce a temperature increase of 1.7 or 5 degrees centigrade by the end of the century. Um, but even today, our president is not convinced that we succeeded in detecting this small signal within the noise, and he wants more research, or doesn't want more research. <laughs> so factor number two, they perceive the problem. Factor number three, the next last factor, and in a way, the most surprising, but also the most common explanation for failure is a society failing to try to solve a problem that it perceives. And often the explanation is what economists call rational behavior, or what an ecologist would call the tragedy of the commons, or what lay people would call a clash of interest, namely the damage to the environment results from a process that is good for some people and is bad for other people. So it is rational behavior, it is smart behavior for the short-term interest of the people causing the damage to cause the damage. They profit from it even though the rest of the society doesn't. Prime examples are the tragedy, what Garrett Hardin called the tragedy of the commons, as illustrated by overfishing. When you have a fishery that is not regulated, where the fishermen cannot agree on joint regulation, and that's especially likely to happen, for example, for an oceanic fishery, which is beyond the 200-mile limit of government regulation. Given that a fishery is not regulated, the fishermen have not been able to agree, the smartest policy for an individual fisherman is to go out there and catch as many fish as possible, tending to exterminate the fishery. But since it's going to happen anyway, you might as well be the one to catch the fish. That's a typical example of rational behavior clash of interest. And clashes of interest are particularly common in the case of the decision-making decision elite. What may be good for the elite may be bad for the rest of society. That, of course, is why the CEOs of Enron proceeded to loot the pension funds. They reasoned correctly that they were very likely to get away with it and that it was in their interest to loot the pension funds, even though it was bad for most other people. Similarly, the Maya kings and the Easter Island chiefs were swept up in their own competition for prestige, and Maya kings wanted bigger and bigger temples. Easter Island chiefs wanted bigger and bigger statues, which meant chopping down more and more forests. And the Easter Island chiefs were trapped in this vicious cycle of deforestation. If any Easter Island chief had been ecologically attuned and had said, look, this is stupid, chopping down the forest, I'm not going to do it anymore, the result would have been that his platform had statues lower than all the next platforms, and everybody would say, that chief is a wimp, and the chiefs next door are powerful. We're going to lie with the other chief. The final reason, then, for societies failing to solve problems is that some problems are just too difficult to solve, given the available knowledge and technology. And we are very familiar with that problem in California in the West. In California, we have introduced agricultural pests such as Mediterranean fruit fly and others that we haven't figured out how to exterminate. Just too difficult, given our present knowledge. And the American Intermontane West suffers from severe problems of forest fires because we have not figured out an economic way of burning off the accumulated, of getting rid of the accumulated fuel load that would prevent <coughs> the burning, the explosion of large forest fires. So there's this roadmap of reasons why a society may do something that, in retrospect, we would say is dumb. And of course, 50 or 100 years from now, 50 years from now, my sons are going to look back on what the voting generation of today said. They'll be asking, how on earth could those people have done things so dumb and wasn't obvious to them, just as we say about these two islands. The last thing that I wanted to talk about is a sign of hope. It's easy to get depressed when you think of all these environmental problems because it looks as if the world today is dominated by two forces, governments and big businesses, which are far more powerful than the public or the individual consumer. And if a rich big business decides that it's going to do something, if a wealthy logging company decides that it's going to log, how on, and it's backed by the government, how on earth can the public ever stop that happening? 
Well, signs of hope of what's called the movement towards independent third party certification of industries' environmental practices. Over the last, especially over the last 15 years, some really big companies have recognized that there are economic costs to the company itself as well as to the society as a whole, of destructive environmental practices. There are some events that served as wake-up calls in different industries. In the oil industry, it was the Exxon Valdez oil spill that cost Exxon something like $4 billion, far, far more than elementary precautions to ensure the safety of oil tankers um, would have cost. And the oil industry has done a lot to clean up its act since Exxon Valdez, the international oil industry. The chemical industry similarly was scared by the Bhopal chemical spill, which cost Union Carbide several billion dollars. The wake-up call for the coal mining industry came in 1972 with the Buffalo Creek Dam failure that killed 172 people, led to the threat and reality of government regulation of coal mining environmental practices. And then the, the disastrous closure of Bougainville's copper mine, a $4 billion disaster in the tip of Rio Tinto, um, in 19, around 1990, belatedly maybe starting to serve as a wake-up call to the hard rock mining industry. It turns out, this is something that I've discovered working in New Guinea in the last five years. Um, I'm on the board of directors of World Wildlife Fund US, and, and Chevron, the Chevron oil company, manages, has managed the producing oil field in the eastern half of New Guinea. And Chevron decided that it was in, in its interest to behave cleanly there so as not to have a $4 billion disaster. And they wanted to make good publicity. So they started telling the public, we love the environment. We're doing a clean job. And the public, the public reaction was, ha, 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 you liars. We can't believe you. So that illustrates why Chevron realized that it was no good for them to be saying that they were doing a clean job. They had to get a recognized, unbiased, third party to audit what they were doing and to comment. And so for the last five years, I've been going into the Chevron managed oil fields of Papua New Guinea to say what I saw there. I've also been in Indonesian oil fields managed by Pergamina. In both cases, I was the guest of the oil company. They provided me with vehicles. They put me up. Um, they let me talk to anybody that I wanted. So to both of these companies, I owe a debt of kindness. And nevertheless, the Pertamina fields were in terrible shape. And the Chevron oil fields were managed more rigorously from an environmental point of view than any national park in the Pacific. Well, this, this illustrates that Chevron has gotten big economic advantages out of world wildlife being able to march in and out there and comment on their environmental practices, which happen to be clean practices. And among other things, it meant that when the government of Norway was putting out to bid a new a newly discovered oil and gas field in the North Sea, a number of oil companies bid, and Chevron's bid was no better than that of some of the other oil companies. But Chevron got the contract because Norway cares a lot about environmental practices and recognized Chevron's reputation for clean environmental policies. So the movement for independent third party certification has arisen as a way of providing the public with credible information about the environmental policies of business, businesses information more credible than a logging company or a mining company itself saying, we are doing a clean job, to which we say, ha, ha, ha. The two of those movements um, are what's called the Marine Stewardship Council and the Forestry Stewardship Council. The Marine Stewardship Council was launched in 1998. One of the world's biggest processes of frozen fish is a British company called Unilever, um, whose brand in the US is Gorton, and in the UK it's it's Iglo. And Unilever executives started to get, to get concerned that their, their business was in fish, but the world's fisheries were collapsing, and that this eventually would mean a collapse for Unilever. So what to do? And Unilever got together in 1998 with World Wildlife Fund to work out standards for sustainable fisheries and to let some independent body check whether a given fishery was being managed sustainably. And that movement has now been jo joined by some other big businesses, including Whole Foods, which is the world's largest retailer of organic and natural foods, and Sainsbury's, which is the United Kingdom's largest seller of seafood and fish products. So that was 
marine certification in 1998. Forest certification started even earlier in 1993 when some logging companies, just like Unilever, got concerned that their business was in trees, but trees are getting eliminated around the world. And so some logging companies got together with World Wildlife Fund, again, to work out standards of sustainable forestry. And the companies that have now joined in the forestry certification movement include Home Depot, which is the biggest purveyor of retail of timber products, not only in the United States, but also in the world. Lowe's, which is the second biggest purveyor of timber products in the United States. And B&Q, which is the United Kingdom equivalent of Home Depot. In both cases, the Marine and Forest Stewardship Council, they began by agreeing on standards for sustainable operation. You chop down trees no faster than they can grow. You catch fish no faster than the fish can reproduce. And a host of, and you've got to maintain ecosystem services. You've got to respect laws. You've got to provide benefits for the local community, um, et cetera. So first, it took a couple of years to agree on, on the standards for an environmental clean operation. Then the MSC and the FSC themselves do not certify fisheries or forests. Instead, what they do is they certify auditing companies. So there are, in the case of forestry, there are about 12 businesses around the world whose job is, at the request of logging businesses, to go in and see whether a forest is being managed sustainably. So the MSC and FSC certify the certifiers. A company, a logging company or a fishing fleet, then applies, if it chooses to do so, to the MSC and FSC. It's completely voluntary. If a logging company thinks that it's in its interest and it's going to get more business as a result of ending up with the FSC eco-label, then it chooses to apply. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. And it has to pay money for the, for the audit. Experience has turned out that the cost of the audit for fisheries is you repaid by increased sales uh, within a year or two. The end result, then, is the products from that forest or that fishery that have been checked against a series of sustainable standards are permitted in the retail market to bear a logo saying MSC certified or FSC certified. It turns out that enough of the public cares about environmental issues to make it profitable, advantageous for timber products and fish products to be certified. There was a study done at two Home Depot stores in Oregon, one in a more conservative town and the other in a more liberal town. And the experiment consisted of having two bins near each other with identical sized pieces of plywood. And in one bin, the plywood had the FSC, the Forest Stewardship Council logo, and the other it didn't. And the experiment was run twice. First, the plywood in the two bins was priced at identical costs. And it turned out that in the, even in the conservative town that didn't care so much about environmental matters, the certified plywood had 20% higher sales than the uncertified. And in the more liberal environmentally aware town, the certified plywood outsold the uncertified plywood by a factor of six, an enormous advantage. The public cares about these things. And then the experiment was rerun, making the certified plywood more expensive than the not certified plywood. And not surprisingly, the majority of people went for price and bought the cheaper plywood. But what was interesting and a little surprising and encouraging to those in this area is that about 40%, although 60% of customers went for the cheaper product, 40% of them paid more in order to get the certified product. So the public really does care. There is a market for environmental certification. What's turned out to be crucial in this area is two things, chain of custody and identifying the pressure points. By chain of custody, I mean that most products don't go straight from a forest to a retail store, but they go from a forest to a lumber mill to a wholesaler to an intermediate processor to a furniture manufacturer to another wholesale buyer um, and then on to the retail store. And so, you, so it's no good to say this is a certified forest if the lumber from that forest goes to a sawmill that is also receiving lumber from an uncertified forest. Because the result might be that you buy some timber in the store which, which was supplied by the certified forest, but along the line it got diluted with uncertified timber that was thrown in the sawmills and furniture manufacturers on loop. 
So both the MSC and FSC carry out what's called chain of custody certification. They require that the certified and uncertified products be segregated every step along the line, and they trace them through, typically an eight or nine step business process, so that when you buy the product in a store, you can be confident that this really is a biomedically certified product. And the other thing that proved crucial, and something that I've appreciated only in the last month or two, is the importance of identifying the susceptible pressure points along this chain. I naively um, used to assume that people outraged at the bad behavior of logging companies or fishing companies should go protest and wave placards around the forest itself or where the fishing boats come into port. And in some businesses, that's right. In some businesses, it's wrong. In the oil industry, it does make sense to protest against a dirty oil extracting company because the oil companies that extract the oil are, in many cases, also the ones that sell it in the gas stations. And so when Exxon had its Exxon Valdez spill in the 1980s, the public had the opportunity to express its wrath at Exxon by stopping buying Exxon gasoline. So in short, in the oil industry, there is one step, often one step, from the oil extractor to the customer, and the customer can vent their wrath. In the coal mining industry, there are usually one or two steps. Uh, the coal mine then provides either to the generator plant or to one intermediate step, but it's only two or three steps removed. And again, the customer can figure out who's supplying the dirty coal and express their wrath. But that's not the case in the mining industry, the timber industry, and the fishing industry, where typically there are eight, eight or nine steps between the consumer that sees the product and the initial extractor of the product. For example, my gold ring. Many of you here probably have gold wedding rings. And gold is often mined in, it's usually mined with cyanide, and the cyanide is disposed of often in a filthy way. But I don't have the faintest idea where the gold in my gold ring came from. I don't know whether this gold was mined 20 years ago, because gold from many different sources is mixed. It's sent to the smelter, and it's mixed more, and it's refined. Then most of it gets sent to India, and then it gets sent to small businesses in India for manufacturing jewelry, and then it gets sent to centralized um, wholesalers in Europe, and then it gets sent out to a retail store. So if I'm angry at the practices of gold miners, I wouldn't know what mine to, to boycott. But the secret is identify the pressure point. And in the case of gold mining, so what you've got to do is to identify a large business that sells to the consumer, or else a large buyer group, group of companies that sell to the consumer, that do care about their image, and that are sensitive to the public, and you put the pressure on them, and they're the ones who will then put the pressure on the extraction industries. For example, gold. Tiffany Jewelers is sensitive about their gold. Tiffany Jewelers was afraid of having the public marching up and down in front of Tiffany's stores, saying <laughs> Tiffany uses gold extracted with cyanide that dumps cyanide into river and kills fish. And so to forestall that possibility, Tiffany then sought out the cleanest of the gold miners, Rio Tinto. Rio Tinto itself is not, sub is not subject to pu public pressure, but it does care about Tiffany. Or again, titanium. Titanium, uh, titanium is used in many paints and in space shuttles and in, in hot in surfaces being used for, in the chemical industry for, for hot vessels. And we, the public, don't, don't know where our titanium is or where our titanium comes from. But DuPont, the large chemical manufacturing company, DuPont manufactures, a bit, it doesn't mine any titanium, but it manufactures about 80% of the world's titanium products. And DuPont puts its name on all its products. And DuPont did not want the public marching up and down um, in front of or boycotting DuPont products because of the filthy practices of titanium miners. So DuPont, to anticipate trouble, DuPont leaned on all of their titanium suppliers and made those filthy titanium suppliers clean up. Home Depot initially was dragged somewhat reluctantly into the environment, area of environmental certification of forestry products by protest by the Rainforest Action Network. But once Home Depot was dragged in, they got the idea and realized that it was good for them. And it's now Home Depot that is putting pressure on the logs in Chile and South America that the American public has no leverage over. And then in the fishing industry, while the public has no leverage over the fishing boats, Unilever, Sainsbury, 
and Whole Foods, the main buyers, do have leverage over the force efficient votes and starting to make them clean up. So, in short, then, I began by talking about past societies that made environmental messes by deforestation or any of seven other means, and that often ended up in their collapsing, an example being East Rock. But it's not the case that all past societies messed up their environments. Many succeeded. And part of the reason the Easter Island case tells us why some societies succeeded and others failed is that some societies live in much more fragile environments than do others, and they had harder environmental problems to deal with. Why do societies not see this coming? It turns out it's complicated and subtle, and there are many reasons why a society may not anticipate or perceive or choose to deal with or succeed in dealing with their environmental problems. And finally, is this all so depressing that we should uh, give up and re resign ourselves to the world being a mess in 50 years from now? No, there are, there are hopeful things happening even in the business world. And even the biggest companies have found advantage. Some of them are starting to find advantages in pursuing clean environmental policies. So it's yes, hope. Thank you. of ecotourism on environmental preservation, both positive and negative. You're correct that ecotourism may have good consequences and also may have bad consequences. The bad consequences may arise if lots of people march over a fragile environment um, in an unregulated way. There are quite a few cases where ecotourism has proved of decisive importance. The two examples, the ex Three examples that come to mind. Montana, where I spend my summers. Now, an, an increasing fraction of the Montana economy, with logging, mining, ranching phasing out, is based on ecotourism. And even Montanans who don't care about the environment are starting to realize there's money in it. The Galapagos, I believe that now the major buttress of the Galapagos economy is ecotourism, along with fishing. And in the Galapagos, they're very concerned, and you have to stick to the paths. And in New Guinea, where I do my field work, again, for the New Guinea government, ecotourism, after the extractive industries, has been, I think, the major source of foreign exchange. So ecotourism can cause messes or cause good things, and if done properly, it can cause good things. Yes? How do the more developed countries, what is their role and helping the less developed countries, which have to grow a little bit off the expense of the environment, and how can that be put in the equation? Big question. How can the, how can the more developed countries, the richer countries, how can they help the poorer countries? In a lot of ways, and since September 11th, we've realized it's in our own selfish interest to be concerned about environment, environmentally fragile countries like Somalia and Afghanistan. Many ways, a little way. Um, logging companies in, in poor countries often can't afford the money to pay for the audit. So there is a foundation in the United States, the Packard Foundation, that pays for the expense of getting audited. That's a very small way. There has been much discussion about the destructive effects of rich countries on third world countries. For example, most of the timber from tropical rainforests, well, much of the timber from tropical rainforests is not consumed locally, but is exported especially to Japan and Southeast Asia. So that's an example of how first world countries can do bad. The United States has much on its conscience for doing bad to the environment. For example, in, promote, in promoting forest clearance in Central America and South America. So in short, 
The first world, because it's the richest, most powerful part of the world, bears the largest share of the responsibility. And what's clear in the last two years is that this isn't charity anymore. This isn't gracious foreign aid. This is life and death for us. Yes and back. Um, to some extent, the impact is a function of sort of impact per person times the number of people impacting it. And so, you know, whether there's 5 billion people or 10 billion people in the world makes a difference. Did you see any, in your study of the 80 societies, did you see any aspect of population management going on? Yes. A question is, is there, was there population management going on in these Pacific Island societies? Yes, there was. For example. And it's well documented by ethnographers. For example, Tikapia Island, settled about 3,000 years ago, has operated sustainably until modern times. Tiny island, one square kilometer with 1,000 people. And it kept on going for a couple thousand years. They've regulated their population in ways that today are not socially accessible. And they did it by infanticide. They did it by abortion. Um, and they did it by enforced emigration. One of the difficult problems today is that traditional societies did have ways of regulating their population density. And most of those ways are now declared unacceptable in the modern world. But unfortunately, the government of the United States also declares unacceptable the modern ways of dealing with the population problem. So it's, it's our obligation, having said that infanticide is not nice, it's our obligation to provide a substitute for it in that there. In many ways, your work is dealing with, like, uh, sorry. Um, natural resource constraints and, and sensitivities on human population and societies. And it's my feeling that the greatest sensitivity we have now is that we have, we have gone beyond natural constraints because of fossil fuels, and that we're now very sensitive to fossil fuel limitations. So we're, we're pretty much feeding people by, by you know, using fossil fuels to make nitrogen that goes into fertilizers. And a lot of studies by people like David Pimentel of Cornell University suggest that once you let, once fossil fuel consumption peaks and starts to decline, then food consumption is going to be constrained a great deal as well. So have you looked at all to the issue of, of peaking of fossil fuels? On that score, about four years ago, um, I was a guest at a, another university Oregon State University, where I was going to give a lecture. And before the lecture, there was a dinner, and the host of the dinner was a wealthy person who had given lots of money to Oregon State University. And that person's particular interest was increasing the availability of energy, not just fossil fuel, but other energy sources. Because his naive belief was that if we could make widely available cheap energy that would be good for the world. And I had to exercise extreme tact to keep my mouth shut and say to him, you are one of the most dangerous people in the world. <laughs> you know, if, if we could lift the ceiling set by energy, then we would bump against the ceiling due to other things. Yes? Uh, has there been any uh, comparable attention given to deforestation in remote uh, Atlantic islands? On remote Atlantic islands, um, yes, Saint, of, of the remote Atlantic islands, St. Helena and Ascension, and there's one called Fernando de No, no the coast of Brazil. Thank you, General Roger. My bad Portuguese pronunciation. Atlantic islands, like Pacific islands, are known to have supported forests and species of birds that were eradicated. For example, St. Helena, famous mainly for Napoleon having been exiled there. I think the British, the British military may have used it as a staging base during the Falkland War. Um, St. Helena had a species of flightless Hopi, and it also had a flightless cuckoo. So yes, it's not only Pacific islands that got environmentally destroyed, but Atlantic. The difference is that the Pacific Island environmental destruction was pre-European. There's, of course, been European destruction added on top of that. 
But for example, for New Zealand and Hawaii, the original settlers, the Polynesians, wiped out about inadvertently wiped out about half the birds, and Europeans have wiped out about half the birds who remain. Whereas in the Indian Ocean and in the Atlantic, apart from Madagascar, there were no pre-European settlers, and so all of the damage has been done by Europeans. Yes? How does your, I'm not sure method is the word, is the correct word, how does your method scale up to larger societies, for instance, the Roman Empire? Right. For, for larger societies, the, the ones that I discuss in my book include China, which is the modern China, which is the largest society that the world has ever seen, and it suffers from the full panoply of 12, the major 12 environmental problems. The United States, which again is large and wealthy. The societies that I look at in the past, the ones that I discuss in detail in my book, um, are mostly smaller societies because archaeologists have obtained better understanding of them. But I'll, I'll have at least brief discussion of the Western Roman Empire, Fertile Crescent, Harappa, Indus Valley civilization. Yes? A uh, review of the archaeological record, it seems, would reveal this list of failed societies and fail, failures to respond to ecological crises. Have you identified cases in the past where there were impending ecological crises that were avoided by either conscious decision or by some technological fix. I'm thinking, uh, for example, the British Isles were, were once much more forested than they are now, and if, the, if Great Britain had continued to build wooden ships at the rate that they were building them in the 18th century, I could see that they wouldn't have any trees. But uh, steel came along, and uh, technology changed, and so there was a relief, and and the British Isles didn't collapse because they deforested themselves. Yes. But uh, are there other examples of successful response to an impending uh, ecological disaster in the more remote past? Yes, there, there are. There are um, the question is, are there examples from the remote past of successful responses to impending ecological disasters? Yes, there are. And usually they did not involve a technological fix, but a perception and decision on the part of people, which is also what we're going to have to depend on for the most part today. Prime examples include the Inca Empire, which includes a lot of land susceptible to deforestation. And the Inca Empire embarked on a successful program of reforestation. Second example, Tikopia in the Southwest Pacific, which micromanaged its environment and not only instituted infanticide, but did lots of things to micromanage the environment itself that kept Tikopia sustainable for 3,000 years. Tonga, Tahiti, Japan around 1600, again instituted rigid forest control. Germany, I believe in the last century, instituted rigid forest control. So there are success stories both recently and in the past. I think we're going to have to bring this to a close. Maybe one more question. In the front here, yes. Um, I want to just continue that story about Britain, because in fact what they did is they exported their problem, didn't they? Because they, they went to North America and deforested North America. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You are correct that the British exported their problem. And export of problems is a common phenomenon today. For example, the reason that Japan, something like 74% of the surface area of Japan is forested, and the percent forest cover in Japan is increasing rather than decreasing. So the Japanese have been terrifically successful at managing their forest estate. And the way that they've done it is by depleting the forest estates of other countries, especially in the Southeast Pacific. Same is true of fisheries. Uh, now that the Grand Banks fishery has been depleted in the California sardine fishery, um, we, and especially the Europeans, have been depleting other fisheries further afield. Um, I mentioned that the main driving force behind tropical deforestation, not only in the South, Southeast Asia and the Pacific, but also in Africa and South America, is increasingly people exporting their own 
problems. Um, so you're correct in saying, in a certain sense, we can't export our problems. Namely, it's not in our interest. But as we saw in the past, people often don't perceive their interests. And it's important that we do perceive our interests, our own self-interest. Maybe that's a good note I wish. Thank you all for coming. You've been a great audience. <laughs>